Oh, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna record this on my own computer, so let's get that going. Um, yeah, there we go. Should I record at 30 frames per second or 25? Uh, you get 29.97. I don't know. What? Okay, we will just go up to 30. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, this talk is about um, teaching computers how to play video games. Uh, this is inspired in part by some of my own work um, for fun, you know, in this uh, interesting and challenging area of uh, computer science. And um, it's also kind of an overview of machine learning in general, uh, just a little taste of what um, machine learning is and what you can do with it. Um, this is me. Uh, I, uh, I don't have any uh, training in computer science, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, the presentation's free. <laughs> <laughs> so what is machine learning? Uh, machine learning is a way for computers to learn things without actually being, um, being programmed. Um, and uh, it allows them to, be, uh, to predict the future, to make decisions, to classify things into categories, um, after studying examples uh, that humans provide them. Uh, machine learning is really kind of the basis of artificial intelligence um, and kind of most exciting to, uh, to me. It really is one of the hottest areas of computer science today. There's a ton of work going into it and, um, um, and there are a lot of people all the time making really interesting discoveries. Um, <clears throat> and people kind of quickly, <laughs> There's a large overlap between people who are interested in machine learning and people who are interested in video games. And uh, it's, you know, games actually provide a very uh, natural, nice way to uh, experiment with machine learning because it provides you a nice controlled environment that you can um, experiment with. Games are fun um, and uh, you can compare how well a computer performs at a game against uh, how well a typical, um, you know, like a person uh, performs. And so what I like to do is, uh, you know, I, I looked at these slides and they ended up being a lot of text. And so I interspersed them with a uh, number of, um, of, of videos. And so uh, the one here is uh, the first one. Welcome back. Seth Lynn here. And this is, um, th this is the, uh, the project that actually inspired uh, the work that I did, um, done by uh, Seth Bling, who's a, a YouTuber, former Microsoft guy here in Seattle. And um, I'm just going to let it play, and, and you guys can see for yourself what he does. You're watching a skilled player play Super Mario World, but this player is not human. It's a computer program I wrote called Mario. This program started out knowing absolutely nothing about Super Mario World or Super Nintendos. In fact, it didn't even know that pressing right on the controller would make the player go towards the end of the level. It learned all of these things through a process called neuroevolution. In this video, I want to teach you about how Mario learned to beat this level Donut Plains 1, what his brain looks like, and how it's all based on actual biological evolution. So let's start out by actually looking at Mario's brain. Let's play it again, but this time we'll look at Mario's brain as it's making the decisions of what buttons to press. It's going to look a bit complicated at first, but don't worry, I'll help break it down for you. This structure of colored lines and blinking boxes is called a neural network. It's a simple mathematical model for how a brain works, but it can produce some very complicated behavior. With enough computational power, a neural network could come close to simulating a real human brain, but modern technology isn't there yet. On the left side, you have the inputs. This is what Mario sees. It's a simplified view of the level. The white squares stand for blocks the player can stand on, and the black squares stand for moving objects like enemies or mushrooms. On the right side, you have the outputs. These are the eight buttons that Mario is able to press by using its neural network. In between the inputs and the outputs, all those lines and boxes, those are the neural network. And so, uh, you know, just to make sure everyone understands this, because this really is the basis of, of a neural network. On the left-hand side, you know, you've got the inputs. So what Seth did is he classified everything in the screen into one of three categories. You know, nothing, something you can stand on, or which are those white boxes, or something that could kill you, which are those black boxes. And uh, on the right, you literally have all the buttons that you can push um, in Super Mario World. Uh, up, down, left, and right, and so on. And then uh, the way that this works is the machine uh, draws, at first randomly, connections between those inputs on the left and those outputs on the right. 
and uh, those little boxes you see in the middle are nodes. And so what that means is that you might have multiple um, you know, connections, uh, you know, two going into one, three going into one, or one going into two, and so on. And so those are actually connections within the neural network itself. But at its heart, um, a neural network is actually a pretty simple thing. And the reason that they're so cool is because as they grow and become more complex, they can uh, learn increasingly subtle and complex uh, behaviors. Each free floating box is called a neuron, and the lines connecting those boxes are like the axons and dendrites in a human brain. At any given time, only some of these neurons and connections are actually being used. And this is what people talk about when they say you only use 10% of your brain. The neural network you're seeing is a pretty complicated one, and it got so complicated as a result of a 24-hour evolutionary learning session. So to explain how neural networks work, let's rewind about 24 hours and look at how the whole process started. This is what Mario looked like at the beginning of its training session, all the way back in generation number zero. The program is probably even dumber than you thought at this point. Often it just stands there and doesn't even press any buttons. If Mario stands still for too long, it'll cut off the simulation and try the next neural network. So it's mostly just jumping from one simulation to the next. So what was happening there is, you know, you see up at the, stop, at the top, it says species 71. And so the computer was generating random connections between the inputs and the outputs. And um, if nothing happens within a certain amount of time, like a half a second or something, the computer just says, oh, this isn't working, and it goes on to the next random um, neural network. And so that's how it starts. And so what, what happened just now is, um, you know, it created a net, by random, it created a network that happened to make Mario run to the right. And uh, it said, oh, okay, now this is doing something. And so, you know, let's, let's see how well it does. But occasionally, the neural network says to press the right button, and the player starts walking right. The behavior isn't complicated, but it's enough to make at least some progress at the level. Let's take a look at a sample neural network to understand just how that works. This is one of the randomly generated neural networks that appeared in the first generation of the simulation. There are some green lines and a red line, and one neuron in the middle. Here's how it works. A green line is a positive connection, and a red line is a negative connection. A green line reading from a black or white square will turn its output the same color. A red line reading from a black or white square will turn its output the opposite color. In this case, the green lines read from the platform that the player is standing on and make the neural network press the right button as long as the player is standing on it. However, when the red line reads a black square representing one of those Capes Koopas, it presses the A button and makes the player jump. The All right, does everyone see how that works? And so the, the lines literally connect to that box there. So the red line is a not, and the green line is, a, you know, is just a equality. So if there's a white square touching one of those green lines, that maps directly, you know, it'll, it'll press the right button. And if um, a black square is touching one of the, that, that one um, red line, it'll hit the A button. And it's really as simple as that. So this puts the player in a position where the green lines are no longer reading a white square, so the right button so he stops. turns off and Mario just stands there. This is a really basic example that illustrates how a more complicated neural network might operate. The more lines and neurons you have, the more nuanced the decisions can be. So how exactly do we get those more complicated neural networks? The answer is evolution. When Mario gets further right on the screen, its fitness goes up. In this case, fitness is a function of how far right it gets and how quickly it gets there. So w what the fitness is, is it's a measure of, yeah, the, far, the, the um, farther it gets to the right, the higher the number is, and the faster it gets to the right, the higher the number is. And so the machine is trying to max out that number, and that's how it compares two different neural networks. So if one gets, it, it gets a higher fitness, then that network is the, uh, the winner. Only the neural networks that produce the highest fitness are selected to be bred, creating the next generation. It took 34 generations of genetic breeding and fitness evaluation before Mario was able to finish the level without dying and get a fitness score above 4,000. You can see there were several places it got stuck for a few generations, but it always evolved out of those ruts. Let's take a look at a few of those ruts. You can look at the top left corner of the screen to see what generation number each rut occurred on. This process of picking the fittest individuals from each generation, breeding them together, and adding random mutations very closely matches the actual process of biological evolution that took single-celled organisms and produced intelligent humans. And so this is one, you know, 
kind of the central question with um, with machine learning is how you know okay you know we have this network how do we actually make it do something useful and um, what Seth just described is one approach called a genetic algorithm and this approach tries to um, mimic actual uh, biological uh, evolution and so you know the neural networks that are generated at the beginning are kind of like you can think of them as being random mutations in a genome and so uh, what it does after each generation is it takes those uh, two models that have the highest fitness and it, and it breeds them, it literally combines them and then it throws in a few uh, random mutations and that then forms the next generation that are then tested. And so it, you know, this approach really tries to mimic um, evolution and uh, is kind of one of the major um, uh, schools within uh, machine learning. But um, you can, and you can find this uh, video on, uh, on YouTube. I, uh, uh, posted, uh, I posted it in the, um, in the uh, slides, which I'll, which I'll publish if you're interested. Um, so, you know, how did, you know, <laughs> where did machine learning come from? You know, outside of academia, um, probably one of the earlier applications of machine learning was to solve a very tricky um, and annoying problem that came for those who are old enough to remember, at the early days of the internet, uh, which was spam. And spam is hard to filter um, because spammers are humans and they're particularly evil, clever humans that you know, are, react to any sort of filter that you build to um, prevent their emails from getting through. And so they're constantly evolving and thinking up new ways that they can avoid your filters. And it's very difficult to distinguish, um, in a lot of cases, uh, spam from something you know that's not spam. Like you know, cheap meds from Canada is spam, but your medication is shipped is not spam. Um, and uh, you know, the the naive approach to solving a problem like this would just be to create a bunch of rules. So you know, I'm going to create a rule that says if I see the word meds, um, that's that's going to be considered spam well, you're going to filter out a lot of, you know, legitimate emails that way. And um, it just doesn't work, you know, and your rule sets become co more complicated and more complicated and more complicated, and you just can never keep up with uh, actual human ingenuity. Um, and so that didn't work. What was needed was a way that you could train a computer to generalize um, based on a number of examples to figure out for itself what constitutes spam and, and, and not spam. And uh, this process is called supervised learning because what you do is, you know, you, the, the, the human, um, give it examples. So you take a bunch of emails and somebody sits down and categorizes each of those emails, spam, non-spam, spam, non-spam. And uh, you yourself maybe unwittingly are actually doing this on like Gmail, for example, when you click the spam button, you're actually providing an example of spam. And it's using that information to improve the model over time. And the reason it's called supervised learning is because you're kind of sitting there guiding it. You're saying, look, this is spam, this is not spam. And you feed that into uh, the machine learning system and uh, um, eventually it gets pretty good. Uh, such that today kind of receiving spam is, is surprisingly infrequent, um, which is a testament to the effectiveness of this approach. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so how does it actually work? Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can approach um, machine learning. Um, in, in all, you know, most of these I'm not even going to start to get into because it's a huge topic, but uh, a lot of spam filtering uses something called a naive Bayesian classifier. Um, you know, uh, uh, these are all different uh, algorithms that people use for um, machine learning. But what we're going to focus on is neural networks um, because they're very widely used, they're very general purpose, and uh, they're a lot of fun to play with. So the basis of a neural network, the inspiration from it came from um, thinking about how our own minds work uh, with, you know, we know that we have a bunch of neurons. Um, I think the number of synapses in our minds is, in our brains is something on the order of like 100 billion or something. It's unbelievably complex. Um, but you see a lot of the same pattern repeated over and over again. And so you have individual neurons 
that are then connected to other neurons. And that's, in essence, what a neural network is. So a neural network will take an input. Um, and remember, the input is just going to be numbers. So whether that's you know, pixels on a screen or um, you know, sounds that it hears or, or you know, words converted into numbers, that, that input layer is just numbers. Um, and uh, then there are multiple layers of neurons. Um, and then at the output, it's what you finally get as a result of you know, going through the network. Um, and so the way that the learning actually works is every one of these connections between neurons has a weight. It's just a number. Um, and so what, you know, as information propagates uh, through the network, you know, let's say we start with you know, this neuron gets an input of 100. OK, fine. So then all of the neurons in the, in the following layer get that, that uh, particular number uh, multiplied by the weight. So 30, 50, or 80. And then those neurons, in turn, pass um, those numbers on to the next layer. And at its heart, it's kind of as simple as that. There are some subtleties involved, of course. Um, but really, this is the, the heart of a neural network. And um, so uh, you know, in practical terms, let's say, you know, uh, <laughs> I think it was Google that made a, um, yeah, it was Google. They, they created a, a, a learning algorithm that uh, learned very accurately to identify cats on the internet. Uh, there are a lot of cats on the internet. <laughs> and um, and the, the, the machine got very good at identifying them. Uh, but let's say, so we're trying, to, we're trying to train our network to recognize cats. And so we start with uh, you know, just a grayscale um, image of a cat. And that image is simply an array of pixels. That's all it is. Each one uh, has a numerical value of between 0 and 255 corresponding to how, how white or how black it is. And so the, you know, that pixel located there goes into the input layer of the uh, neural network, propagates through, and then at the end you have just two outputs, you know, cat and not cat. And that number represents its, its estimate of how probable this image is to actually be a cat. So, okay, that's pretty good. You know, we humans can recognize, yes, that obviously is a cat. Um, but, uh, um, I, you know, I, I think it should have been a little bit higher than 78%. And so the training happens when um, you say, OK, computer, you know, you thought it was 78% likely to be a cat. I'm telling you that's 100% cat. And so then go back and adjust all of your weights to bring the outputs closer to those numbers. And so this is the learning step um, of a neural network. Uh, it, all of those weights are uh, adjusted to bring um, the, you know, the, S the prediction closer to the actual result. Um, and that's the basis of um, how the network learns. Um, again, in real life, you know, a network may ha easily have uh, millions of different weights uh, that have to be um, uh, adjusted. That's why uh, machine learning typically is computationally intensive. Um, but uh, the beauty of it is it allows you to learn, it, it allows the machine to learn really increasingly complex um, behaviors. Um, and uh, um, there are a lot of different ways of structuring your neural networks that I'm not going to really get into um, because they're kind of beyond the scope of the, of the talk. But suffice it to say that what you're trying to do is, um, because it's computationally expensive, you want to use as few weights as you can get away with. OK, fine. But probably the, um, the even bigger problem and the, the real um, central challenge of machine learning is something called overfitting. And what that means is your, you know, imagine you wrote a neural network. Um, you create a neural network to invest in stocks. And to train, uh, to train your network, you uh, looked at you know, uh, the stock tables for the last 50 years. Um, and uh, you trained it, trained it, trained it. And all of a sudden, you know, your network was really good at invest, you know, would have made you very wealthy uh, if it had been working, if you had it 50 years ago. Uh, the problem is uh, typically with this sort of approach, uh, it is, you know, th this sort of a, a approach really risks overfitting. And so guess what? When, you know, you try and, you know, uh, invest it tomorrow, it likely will fail miserably because 
it was not able to generalize um, the concepts beyond the data that it was uh, trained with. Um, and uh, so one type of neural network that people are very excited about is called a convolutional neural network. Um, these have been, um, these were inspired by the study of uh, the animal visual cortex. So how our eyes work and how our brains perceive uh, vision. And um, probably because of that, they're actually very effective at um, tasks pertaining to image and video classification. Uh, and then as you add layers in these neural networks, um, you know, each, each additional layer in the neural network can learn to identify increasingly abstract concepts. So the very lowest le level of uh, the lowest layer can recognize things like edges, you know, in an image. Um, but then as you increasingly go up uh, through the network, it, you know, you can, okay, you know, different layers can recognize shapes, colors, and then eventually cats, and then eventually types of cats. And so if you have enough layers in your neural network, um, you know, the expressive power of that network really becomes uh, rather amazing. And that's where the phrase deep learning comes in that, you know, you may have, um, you may be familiar with uh, because the networks that people are working on now are typically quote unquote deep, uh, meaning they might have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plus layers to them. Um, so uh, convolutional neural networks really started making waves um, uh, when Stanford uh, won a uh, competition called uh, the ImageNet competition back in 2014. And this competition is based on a, a, a training body of 1.2 million images. Uh, each of those images is classified into one of a thousand different categories by humans. Um, then it's tested on images that it has not yet seen, but for which we know, you know, wh what the image is. And uh, they were able, back in 2014, to achieve this really remarkably low um, rate of error. And uh, so this is, this is it in action. Um, so here's the image that it gets. Hey. Okay, great. Quail. Tibetan Mastiff. And so this is, you know, pretty remarkable. Border is, I guess, really good at identifying breeds of dogs. Brown bear. And then they compare it with, uh, I think they took, were taking kind of a jab at Google. They compared it with uh, Google's results. Um, King penguin. Uh, not so good. Oh, I can't see that. There we go. Gorilla, gorilla, yeah, howler monkey, and I think the way that these are these results are ranked in um, how confident it is. So the number one Google prediction, yeah, it's a gorilla, but uh, maybe it's a howler monkey, and maybe it's a gibbon, um, a gibbon type of primate, uh, sports car, car wheel, sports car, racer, race car, convertible, and so this is the. Uh, uh, this is the actual model that Google trained on those 1.2 million images. Um, and uh, another type of neural network, um, so that was convolutional neural networks. Another type um, is called a recurrent neural network. And these are very effective for problems that involve a sequence. And again, this is kind of approaching how our own minds work. Um, you know, when you're reading something, you um, develop this very strong intuition of what the next word ought to be. Uh, and so I don't need to you know, tell anybody what the next word is in this sentence, but everybody knows you know, what it is. And if this, ends up, if this word actually ends up being like ocean or something, then that's surprising. Um, and that's something that, that you would immediately, um, you know, that would seem strange to you. And, uh, so we can train a neural network in the same, um, in the same manner to uh, take a bunch of text uh, of whatever source you want, and uh, it will learn to write in the style of that particular text. And unfortunately, it, it creates nonsense, but it sounds uh, actually kind of accurate. And so this top one, I, uh, I put in the entire text of the, uh, the Bible into this uh, neural network and asked it to write some text in the style of the Bible. And this is what it came, out, came up with. Uh, and this one was uh, Shakespeare. 
you know, you, you put in the entire works of Shakespeare and ask the neural network to write something in the style of Shakespeare. And, and it's a lot of fun because, you know, you can read it and you say, yeah, that kind of sounds, I mean, it's nonsense, but yeah, it kind of sounds like a Bible verse or a, something that Shakespeare might write. Um, and all that it's doing is, is literally picking, you know, saying, okay, these, these couple characters, these couple letters happen first. What's the next letter likely to be, you know, based on um, the training that, that I provided it? Uh, and so, uh, you know, th this is an example of, um, uh, of a recurrent neural network. Um, and uh, this was um, kind of a combination of the two. So image captioning is where you have the machine write little um, vignettes or little captions about images that you provide it. And so not only here does it have to understand, does it have to recognize the image, it has to be able to say something about that image in words. And so the examples that, uh, you know, uh, that Google came up with, this left-hand column is, yeah, it nailed it. And then, you know, then it's, okay, this didn't do so well in this column. But you can see, um, I mean, it's really remarkable when you think about it. Like this picture that the machine generated this sentence, a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. Um, wow. You know, a close-up of a cat lying on a couch. Okay, it looks kind of more like a bed, but and the cat's not really lying on it, but it's pretty close. And then, you know, okay, not, not quite as good here. You know, a red motorcycle, well, it's a pink moped, you know, parked. It's not really, it's in a parking lot. But you get the idea. And um, so this is, this work was really, qu again, quite recent from 2014 and um, uh, shows the, the powers of when, you know, when you start combining image classification with, um, uh, you know, text generation, you can do, do fun things like this. And wh what really interested me was it really seems to mimic the ways that our own minds work. And this is one way that you teach, um, you know, a child how to read. Um, you give them, you know, an example picture and then a little caption saying what it is. Uh, and so there's something that's going on that's very similar to how our own minds work. And that's one of the reasons that machine learning is so fascinating. So, um, most of what I've been talking about is supervised learning. So that's literally, you know, you take a bunch of examples that you create, you feed them into the machine, and then it learns to recognize those examples and then hopefully learns to generalize based on those examples. Um, unsupervised learning is, uh, in my view, even cooler because it's less work for us. And what that means is you literally you set the machine up in an environment um, and you give it the options it can, the actions that it can take in that environment and the environment itself provides rewards or penalties um, you know, to the machine and then you just let it figure it out. And um, initially the, uh, this was used to solve mazes. So you put, you know, you let the computer control a little character in a maze and it has to figure out how to navigate out of that maze. Um, and uh, and it, it can. Uh, but that's uh, using um, you know, something called uh, reinforcement learning. And this, I think, comes from the um, psycho psych uh, psychology literature, meaning you know, it, you're, you're constantly getting rewards or penalties from the environment. You know, think like you know, a little bit of food or electric shock, you know, um, like the, you know, the, the, the awful things they used to do to rats back in the day. And uh, that's essentially what you're doing to, to the machine. Um, and uh, that's the way that we can actually teach computers to play video games. Uh, because, you know, like I said before, the, a game is a really, really nice environment. It's, it's very well contained. You completely control it. And you've got a reward broke in, uh, built in that's the score. You know, and the penalty is dying. So, okay, there you go. So you, you know, say, okay, machine, you get to push any buttons you want, you know, have at it. And um, uh, then over time, you know, you hope that it learns. And so this is work that, uh, that Google did on this subject that was just fascinating. Um, Here we go. So we used uh, uh, games as a test bed for testing the intelligence of our algorithms. And in order to have true thinking machines or cognition, a system has to be embedded in sensory motor data streams, sensory motor reality. Um, and it has to figure things out for itself. 
So games are actually quite a perfect uh, setting for this. And in fact, we used um, Atari games from the 80s, classic Atari games from the 80s, which are very challenging, but were designed to be challenging for humans, but are not so complex that our AI algorithms couldn't make progress with them. So what I'm going to show you is the AI playing these Atari games. Um, but the only, the only thing it gets, the system gets, is the raw pixels of input. So it's just like a human looking at the screen, um, seeing uh, uh, all the pixels on the screen. And so this, this is how it differs from what Seth did um, in the beginning. Because what Seth did is he, he gave the machine uh, a big leg up. Because he, he said, rather than just giving it just the pixels, it said, oh, here's stuff you can stand on, here's stuff that could kill you. And um, uh, Google's approach is much more general because it literally takes just an image and then just the score and it lets it figure it out. So it's about 30,000 numbers per frame um, because the screen's 200 by 150 pixels in size. And the goal here is to simply maximize the score. Everything is learned from scratch and we, we insist that one, the same system plays all the different Atari games, hundreds of different Atari games. So I'm just gonna run this video now, this is a one minute video. This is Space Invaders, the most iconic game probably um, on Atari. And this first minute, this is before, the first time the AI has ever seen this data stream. So it doesn't, it doesn't know what it's playing, it doesn't know what it's controlling. And you can see it's actually losing its three lives. It's controlling the rocket here at the bottom of the screen. And it's losing its three lives immediately because it doesn't know what it's doing. But after you leave it playing overnight on a single GPU machine, you come back the next day, and now it's superhuman at the game. It's learned for itself, through experience, how to play. So you can see now every single shot it fires hit something. Um, it can't be killed anymore. It's worked out that the pink mothership that comes across the top of the screen in a second Watch this. is worth the most number of points. Um, it does Look at that shot. It does shot to do that. And you can, if those of you remember Space Invaders, as there's less of them on the screen, they go faster. And just watch the last shot um, that it does, the, the rocket does. This is predicting shot to, to, to hit the last Space Invaders. I mean, look at that. So you can see <laughs> how um, perfectly it sort of models the, uh, the, the, the game world and that data stream. Um, so accurately, it can predict ahead of time what is going to happen, just from the pixels on the screen. So there's a second video. It's my favorite video, actually. This is a game of Breakout, and there's more gradations here of the agent getting better, the system getting better. So this is after 100 games. So just 100 games. You can see, again here, the system is pretty terrible, but it, you can probably convince yourself that maybe it's starting to get the hang of the fact that it should move the back towards the ball. Um, now this is after 300 games. So it's now um, hitting the ball back uh, pretty consistently, and it's almost never missing. So it's about as good as the best humans can be at this game. Um, and then we thought, well, that's pretty cool. Well, what would happen if we just left the, the, the machine playing the game for a couple more hundred games? And this amazing thing happened. What happened was it discovered the optimal strategy was to dig a tunnel around the left-hand side here, and then send the ball you know, with this unbelievable accuracy around the back. So, so that's really cool because um, actually the, the, the brilliant programmers and researchers who are on this program, um, they're brilliant at programming and coming up with algorithms, but they're not so good at playing Atari. So, um, <laughs> so they didn't actually know that strategy for themselves. So they, this is something that their, their own creation taught them. And so uh, uh, you can actually get, uh, you, you can download Google's code and get it running on, on your own machine. Um, 